Good evening to everybody. It is 625, just now turning 626. Uh, we come on as normal, just a bit early, so that we'll have an opportunity to get settled, to kind of get our scriptures together, and to meet and greet anyone, even in this unique way that we are having worship and Bible study during this time. For those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith. I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church. Well, God has blessed me to be for over 13 years now, and we're glad to have you with us tonight. For all those who are logging on with us now, feel free to say good evening to everyone and hello. And as I see some of the familiar names and faces, I'll make sure to try to call you out. If I do miss your name or don't see the face, please forgive me. Just please, it's certainly an oversight, certainly not done on purpose. Uh, Sister Turner, good evening to you, to the Turner family. Uh, Sister Davis, Sister Verdi Davis, good evening. Brother Tidwell, Brother Atlanta Hawks, God bless you. I hope everyone is doing fine. I see one half of the A-team on here. Good to have you as well. It's just good to be surrounded by good people and friends and family. Uh, get myself settled here. And I hope everyone is doing well. For those of you who have had to work today, I hope you've had a productive day of work. I hope you were safe and as the scripture says, I hope you worked as unto the Lord. For those who are retired, uh, Brother Tom Milam, good to have you with us, Brother Milam. Uh, for those who are retired, uh, we certainly thank God for you, and you give me a personal goal to shoot for. Let's me know that it can be done. I thank the Lord for many of our members who have retired. Uh, Sister Kathy Turner, good to have you with us as well. Uh, I thank the Lord for those of you who have worked for 20 and 25 and 30, sometimes 35 years or more. Certainly glad that God has sustained you and blessed you with financial uh, financial means to take care of your family and your other obligations. And just glad that you made it to the finish line. Now, hopefully you can enjoy some of the fruits of your labor. Uh, we, we have a guest, uh, I say guest, but she's a friend of our church, Sister Shavers. Uh, was not long ago she lost her father. Uh, we have sad news to announce that she has lost her grandmother recently. And so I want to ask you to please keep her in prayer. Um, it seems like every time you turn around, something is going on. So just remember, it is her time this time. It could be our time next time. So please remember Sister Tanya Shavers in your prayers in the passing of her grandmother. Uh, the funeral services will be held this Saturday. I'm going to make sure I get the date for you. This weekend, this Saturday is July the 10th at Premier Funeral Home on Battery. Premier Funeral Home, July 10th, this Saturday at 11 a.m. The uh, celebration of life for Sister Shaver's grandmother uh, who passed on us recently. Uh, so please keep her and her family in prayer. To the Tim's family, God bless you. I hope you're doing fine as well. Hope everyone had a productive and a safe uh, 4th of July weekend and celebration. For those who traveled, we pray that you made it to your destination and back to your homes safely. I'm sure many of you had fireworks and barbecue and if nothing else, just the time to be off and relax and spend time with your family. At least you have a day to take care of, of some things around the house. And if nothing else, you can just sit back and relax and just enjoy a peaceful day. The weather was pretty good. I'm sure you had your AC going. Lord knows I had mine going as well. So we had family over. We had a good time. Had a wonderful time seeing everyone. Uh, today we have a very good question, very practical question. One that all of us will eventually go through and probably has gone through. So if you don't mind, if you can pause what you're doing, we have made it to 630. The only way to teach people to be on time is to begin on time. So I thank the Lord for a timely church, timely staff, timely membership. So I'm going to ask you, uh, to the good sister, the Burnett family, good to see you too. I'm going to ask you all if you can pause for a moment and let's have us a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. You brought us so far and You've opened so many doors. You've blessed us so much. Father, even when we don't have what we desire, it still seems as if you have taken care of what we need. There are so many in this country and in other countries 
no matter what state we are in presently, they would envy to be in the situations that we are in. Lord, not just the tangible things that we're grateful for, the homes and the clothes and the car. Father, we just thank you for all these things, the job. Father, we thank you for all those spiritual blessings, to have peace, to be able to read your word and understand it, to experience answered prayer. And Lord, we thank you most of all for the gift of salvation that was purchased by your son on Calvary's Hill. We pray, Lord, tonight that as we study your word, although it just may be one question, we see different passages of scripture to go over. As we go through your word, we pray that we can hold on to your hand. We pray that you can feed us, open our hearts, open our minds, help us to find understanding. Help us not to be hearers only, but doers of your word to the point to where many of our foreparents would say, once we know better, we can do better. We want to live a life that's pleasing in your sight. Somewhere along the line, we've done wrong. We have disobeyed. We've transgressed. Father, you know what it is. We ask you to forgive us. Father, we ask you to renew us and restore us. We pray that you can give us the traction to get back on the right road. We just ask you all these things in Jesus' name, and we thank you for it. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. Tonight's a very practical question, one that has come into play much of my life, uh, much of my ministry, um, even recently. The question is for tonight, just one question. Uh, how do you lovingly correct someone who is aggressive and rude. Uh, we don't even have to say if they're aggressively rude. How do you lovingly correct someone of ungodly behavior? Uh, whether they are aggressive and rude, that makes it that much more difficult. But the broad question, how do we correct someone? What is the proper way to correct someone? What is the proper way to let someone know they have offended us or they have been continually offending us? Do we let it go? Should we let it go? If we correct them, how do we correct them? So how do you lovingly correct someone of ungodly behavior? And the question is even stated, especially if they are aggressive and rude. Let me first give you this testimony. Uh, two weeks ago, my, my car went down. My car didn't stop, but my air condition stopped blowing cold. And the way I was brought up, my mother didn't turn on the AC uh, until she absolutely had to. She was a single mother, so she tried to save money as much as she could. And so from that upbringing, I promised myself, I don't care if my light bill is a million dollars. I'm going to have air in my home. And Lord, if you bless me also, I want to have it in my car. So when my air went out, I thought I could fix it. I couldn't do it. Took it to the shop, dropped it off two weeks ago. Didn't hear anything back. I called them back. Oh, we had to order parts. Okay, thank you. I mean, I wish they would have told me that. Well, a few days go by. I'm like, well, have the parts come in? You know, I called back. Well, some of the parts came in. The rest of them didn't come in. Okay, okay. Well, when do you think? Oh, oh, by tomorrow. Okay. That day came. I called again. Nothing happened. Oh, oh might be Monday or Tuesday of next week. I'm getting frustrated, okay? So I didn't wait, I, I didn't say a word, I waited till Tuesday, same thing. I spoke to a manager, uh, oh, we're fixing the car right now. That was on Wednesday of this past week, we've just gone through, last week. Car should be fixed either today or tomorrow, Wednesday or Thursday. I didn't call again Wednesday, I didn't call again Thursday, Friday morning, I had pretty much had my feel. I called. It had to be 7.30. They opened at 7. I called, spoke with them. Oh, your car's done right now. Honestly, I thought they were lying to me. I thought it may have been done, and they just didn't call me. Got a ride. My Aunt Rosetta was in town. Went down there, dropped off, got my car. Yeah, your paperwork is ready. Okay, I'm ready. Where do I sign? Well, go sit over there in the waiting room. I went to the waiting room and I sat down. I began to replay everything I've gone through. And I said, no, no, no. I need to talk to somebody. I talked to the clerk, the young man who checked me in. You told me such and such and so and so. What kind of paperwork? You told me it was done. 
Should have been done two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. I said, well, let me speak to a manager. The manager's around the corner. I didn't like the way he signaled who he was. I'll get to that in a minute. He signaled and said his name. Here I am with a tone like, oh, brother, I don't want to deal with this. That pushed me into a further bad mood. Went around the corner, spoke with him, and I just directly told him, here's what happened, A, B, C, one, two, three. I said, this is bad. So I've been coming here, you know, for a long time. This is the worst customer service I've ever had. I said, what kind of paperwork are you doing? Long story short, he, um, he did make amends for it. But in that situation, I was upset. I was rightfully upset. That may not have been ungodly behavior per se, but I had to speak for myself. I had to say something to somebody. This is, I'm a paying customer. I've been pushed to the side. In some cases, probably lied to. And so I spoke to him. In that moment, I wanted to speak to him, speak to the other young man in a way that if I were being recorded, I wouldn't mind hitting play on the screen that we have behind the pulpit at New Hebrew. That was the approach in my head. Was I angry? Yes, I was angry. Did I have a right to be angry? Yes, I had a right to be angry. But being angry for being offended and being wrong still does not give you the license in scripture as a Christian to lose your composure, to act a fool, to say things that you shouldn't say and behave in a way that's unbecoming for a Christian. So that was a small situation and that type of thing happens to all of us. How do you correct someone when you've been personally offended? They've been rude to you. They've been inconsiderate or they've been mean. How do you correct someone at church? At church, someone who's callous, uh, someone who's overbearing. How do you do that? How do you correct someone in your family? Because yes, remember the sermon, ser sermon series, Dysfunctional Family? Sometimes you have people in your family that love controversy, scandal, and don't let you go through a bad situation. They cling to it and like a moth to the flame. Someone in the family, in your family that may be arrogant or they'll air out your dirty laundry. They make you the butt of their jokes, not having fun with you, but literally to put you down, to malign your character. Well, that's what the question is talking about today. That's what we're going to explore. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There are many approaches we could take for this, but the first approach, the first thing that comes to mind is when you correct someone, when you have to have that awkward confrontation, Let's make sure that it's not over something that's small, that's trivial, or insignificant. A friendship, a family relationship, uh, a work relationship, let's not tarnish it, stain it, st stretch it out, or even tear it up over something that's not worth it. And the Bible speaks about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 we're going to look at verse 5, and then we're going to look at verse 7. We don't have to go through the, uh, all of the verses. This particular passage is Paul correcting the Corinthians over taking spiritual problems from among the saints to the heathen law courts. Pay attention. It's not wrong to go to court. Paul appealed to one of the Roman officials because he was a Roman citizen. When Paul stood before Felix and Agrippa, Paul really didn't even talk about himself as much as he talked about Jesus to the point to where King Agrippa said, man, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Point being, there's not a sin inherently to go to church. This passage is not teaching that. The point that Paul is making is that how can you take some small insignificant, trivial thing and can't handle it in-house and take it to heathen courts before the unsaved. And Paul is in that line of thinking when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5. 
Paul is speaking to these Corinthians who've been doing that. He says in verse five, I speak to your shame. He said, you should be ashamed of yourself. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? Is there no one that's mature enough inside the ranks? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Paul is saying that's a shame that Christians have to let something small, trivial, or insignificant that can't be or should be handled in-house that you have to go to Judge Judy, Judge Joe Brown, to law courts, presumably to handle a spiritual matter before the unsaved. That's verse 5. Uh, if you still have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 6, jump down to verse 7. In verse 7, Paul gives the remedy. He says, now therefore, there's utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Paul said, that's a problem. That's a problem that you cannot handle these small things between yourselves. He says, here's the remedy. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? The point of it is, is that when we talk about correcting someone who has offended us, correct, pardon me, correcting someone who is aggressive and mean for some ungodly thing that they've done, but they're aggressive, make sure that you don't go into that situation over something that is trivial, something that is small, something that is insignificant. Now, I can't give you a list because something that's small to me may be big to you. Something, you know, small to you may be big to me or vice versa. So I can't give you that list of what that could be. But do some self-inventory. Don't ruin a friendship or don't cause a bad situation to get worse over something that can just be ignored. There are things that fall into the category of that's just water off of a duck's back. That doesn't even deserve to be addressed. That doesn't even need to be handled. That's, I've grown enough, I'm mature enough to where that type of situation, that doesn't affect me at all. Now, so first of all, before we talk about trying to correct someone or point out some offense they've done to you, do some self-inventory. Take a step back and say, is this a significant thing? If it's not, dear friends, leave it alone. Now, here we go. Let's move on to stage two. Okay, this is not small. Sister Tippin, Sister Diana Tippin Shelton, this is not small. This is serious. This is something that must be addressed. So the next thing you want to consider is depending on the nature and the extent of the offense, Something must be done. Listen, let's just say what happened to you. This is not trivial. It's not small. Well, that means you must take action. Well, what does the Bible say about that? I'm glad you asked. Now, we want to give a couple of examples to where God, through the Apostle Paul, I'm going to use him in two separate passages. We're going to give a couple of examples from the Bible to where God allows a situation or in whatever way you get there, you are in a situation and you must take action. Let me talk to you about that first. There does come a time to where God says, I appreciate you praying about it. I appreciate you trying to get wisdom from me and wisdom from the word as uh, uh, excuse me and be led by the Holy Spirit. But all signs point to you must do something. You must do something when that time comes. To do nothing, mm -mm. you are prolonging your pain. So here we go. I'm going to give two separate examples. We're going to use these. Romans chapter 16, please get your Bibles, and verse 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Then you come to the book of Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 16, and we're going to look at verse 17. And here's what Paul says to the church in Rome. Now I beseech you, brethren, 
mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned once you've looked at them and seen them and marked them and avoid them. Now, now please pay attention to this text here. Paul, when he says, mark them, I, I, I beseech you, I plead with you, I beg you, you must keep your eye on them. It's a, it's a Greek phrase that means to observe with intensity. A phrase that means to scrutinize carefully. Keep your eye on them. Mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have been, uh, which you have learned. Now, now, now listen, this is in the context of false teaching. False teachers who introduce false and erroneous doctrine alongside of true doctrine. Paul says, number one, when preaching and teaching is going on, you should be paying attention. That's not sleeping time. That's not texting time. That's not picnic in the pew time. That's not talking to your neighbor. No, no, that's pay attention time. And when you find someone in the pulpit, in a Sunday school class, in a teaching setting, or wherever it may be, you keep your eye on them. Like, wait a minute, he, he said, what? That doesn't, you know. And, and the reason Paul says to do this, not to be a busybody, not to be a spiritual referee, not to be nosy in someone else's affairs and follow someone away, uh, around. No, no, no. He's saying to do this because when false doctrine is introduced, it causes division and offenses. I can speak to that personally because when someone is in Bible study or in Sunday school or they come up to me after I'm done preaching and they say, well, I feel and I think and I feel and I think, you know, and I'll take time to listen. But I had a situation with someone I dealt with for years that it came to the point to where he's not trying to gain answers. He's just trying to throw in this crazy doctrine. And what it did is there were some people who kind of believed it. There were some people who were not mature enough in the faith. And they thought, well, he may have a point. And that caused a clash. And so what Paul is saying, when you have a situation like that, you keep your eye on that person. And once you can substantiate what they're doing is wrong and false, he says, you got to do something. Avoid them. Stay away from them. Now, that may sound trivial. That may sound almost like it won't have an effect. But think about it. That means when we have the barbecue, I'm not calling you to come to the barbecue. And that's not to be crude. That's not to be rude. That's not to be mean. That is me following scripture because we're not going to sit around the grill or on the back deck or in the front yard or in the living room having a good little small talk, watching the game, bellies are full, and then you bring up, you heard about that Mayan calendar? I heard 2012, the world going to end. No, 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 no. It's going to cause problems. So he says, avoid them. Be bold enough, courageous enough to do what God's word says. When an offense takes place, something must be done. That's the whole point. In this case, it's speaking of false teachers, false teaching, bad doctrine being introduced inside of the body of Christ. You keep your eye on them. You scrutinize them. Not that you're a fault finder. You listen intently. Maybe I didn't hear that right. Let me check him out again. So he teaching next week. Okay, let me listen to him in Sunday school. Jesus, what? No, 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 no. Something wrong with that teaching right there. Avoid them. Stay away from them. Their group can no longer be your group. Now, that doesn't mean that you treat them as if they have the plague, but it does mean that you don't intentionally go out of your way to bring them into your social circle. The only reason I can see you reaching out or having a conversation would be to lovingly correct them of that doctrine. So that's, that's one incident. Incident, Romans 16, 17. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. One of my favorite passages. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. Now here we have that Paul has been speaking about 
his own work. The Thessalonians were a small community of believers. They didn't have much money. And so Paul said he was going to work. He was going to use his trade as a means to meet his financial obligations, food, clothing, and ministry, so that he wouldn't have to put this young, new church that didn't have it through a financial ringer. Now, that principle alone could have stopped scores of church fights that I've been privy to and I've seen face to face. Pastor, you know the church ain't got it. You know the church can't afford that. You know that we are a poor people. Nobody here. I mean, we've been given for hundreds of years. We don't have enough money to buy you a new car. We don't have enough money to get your hair cut, your wife hair done, your dog groomed, and your daughter's hair done once a week. We don't have the money to give you insurance. We don't. Listen, if God blessed us, I, I pray that we would have a spirit to want to do it, to be able to make sure that you have these things. But you know we don't have it. So why are you asking us for thousands upon thousands of dollars for your anniversary? And you know the church don't have it. That principle alone, Paul shows his integrity. He knew the church didn't have it. And so why would Paul make an issue out of it? And Paul says, I'm not just talking about me. Now we're going to get to our verse. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul said, for even when we were with you, you remember how we commanded you that if any would not work, he shouldn't eat. If any man doesn't want to work, let him starve. And Paul goes on that theme of people who are able-minded, able-bodied, but refuse to work. Now, this I have to pace myself on is a pet peeve of mine because I have encountered far too many people that are able to work but are not willing to work. Don't bring a sheet of paper to me at church and ask me to sign it as if you've been working at New Hebron and you haven't lifted a finger and I know the only reason you're doing it it's so that you can keep getting whatever support you're getting. I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie on you. And I'm not going to lie for you. If you are able to work, but unwilling to work, God say, let them starve. So Paul is on that theme. Now, as we get to our verse, here's what Paul says in verse 14. Second Thessalonians 3 and 14. Pay attention to this. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, meaning not just the general teaching I've been given, also the specific teaching I've been giving you about a man, man or woman, mankind, who is able-minded, able-bodied, God's financial plan is to work. If any man doesn't obey our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he should be ashamed. Paul is saying, let me bring it up to speed in our terms. If you have somebody that claims to be a Christian and they're inside the Christian community, they attend worship at a local church, and you know for a fact this man, this woman, they are able to work, they can work, but they're just don't, they just don't want to work. And you try to encourage them and other people have tried to encourage them. But this is just going to be their lot in life. I'm content with doing what I'm doing to get this extra income or free income and doing nothing for it. Paul said, no. You make a mark on that man, meaning the same way Paul said in Romans, keep your eye on them, scrutinize them, not a fault finder. But you watch them, make note of that man, and you have nothing to do with them. Well, why should you do that? So that you can show by your actions, I don't get down like that. I don't agree with that. I don't condone that. 
And I'm not going to make you feel comfortable in doing that by my presence being with you. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take action, which in this case is withdrawing myself from inside your social circle. Me and you don't have too much to talk about. Be courteous, be Christ-like, but I'm not going to have a close fellowship with you. That is the literal understanding of what Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, 15, and 16. When you have a person who's able to work, but not willing to work, nothing wrong with their mind, nothing wrong with their body. They just trying to be a scammer or they just lazy. He said, no, avoid them, have no company with them so that they can be ashamed. Because when a person does these things and we carry on with them like nothing is wrong, well, they think nothing is wrong. So the point is, not specifically about the teaching or specifically about the act of non-working, but the point that we're trying to make is that when it comes time to act, something must be done. When, it, when, when, when God's character is on the line, there comes a time when a Christian must take a stand. Now, now, now stay with me here. These things I'm laying out, this is not easy. I, I'm, this is not comfortable. This is, I, I don't want you to misunderstand the spirit of what the scripture is talking about. You, you ever bumped into these people who just blurt out anything? Well, say, well, I'm just telling the truth. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Listen, honesty without kindness is cruelty. You don't score any points with God by being obnoxious. You, you, you've met these people who say, I just had to tell them. I tell them, you know, that's an ugly dress. Who, who, where you buy that wig from? That's a, that's a cheap suit. Where you buy your suits from? I just had to tell them. Everybody can see it's ugly. You're not cool. You don't gain any points with God. That's not an asset to your character. That shows a small spiritual character. That shows a small Christian. Honesty without kindness is cruelty. The Bible says speak the truth in love. There's a time to where you have to tell the truth. The truth doesn't need any help. You can be honest and direct without being nasty and mean and crude and trying to embarrass somebody. The truth has enough power on its own. It doesn't need your help. So these people who think they are bold and big and bad, they're just obnoxious. They're just a bull in the china shop. And they walk around like, look at me. Everybody was thinking it, but I said it. Solomon says, it's a fool that doesn't know when to close his mouth. Just because everything comes up doesn't mean they have to come out. If you see a woman and you can tell her slip is showing, I don't even know if folk wear slips anymore, but I'm using my grandmother's language. If you see her slip is showing, you ain't got to say, hey, fix your slip and then ugly dress. Pull them to the side. Now, I'm going to work on the approach next. Now, now, now listen, we've asserted, number one, make sure that it's not something small or insignificant. Number two, if we can substantiate in your personal situation, this is not something small. This is something that must be addressed. We've seen different examples. We've seen about false teachers. Leave them alone. People who can work but refuse to work, leave them alone. That's not the only verses we can use. There are many, and we'll get to some more. But the point is, there comes a time to where when it comes to correcting someone or to take a stand for the Lord, a Christian must take a stand. Because everybody wants to be a soldier, and it's easy to be a soldier when there's no war to fight. Now, and, and, and let me give a personal testimony here. These things that Paul just talked about, 2 Thessalonians and also in Romans, that's not just for the pastor. Church, Christians, that's for everyone. Listen, I don't mind helping and assisting. I don't mind even speaking with a person or even for a person if they come along with me. But I'm tired of folks being mad at me for stuff I ain't do. I have enough heat that's going to come down on me just for preaching the Bible as it is. 
So don't you don't have to always call me. I don't mind you calling me, but you don't have to always include me. I wasn't there. I didn't see. I didn't hear. The best information I have is going to come from you. You are there on the spot. And sometimes God has allowed you to be there because he wants you to do something. You're right there. There comes a time to take a stand. There comes a time to step in and make a move. So there does come a time where Christians must take a stand. Now, I want to get a few more scriptures here. And the last point is, be mindful of your approach. Three things here. The first one, make sure that it's not something that's small, trivial, or insignificant. Number two, there does come a time when a Christian must take a stand, whether that stand is directly saying something to someone or even we saw in these two passages, indirectly withdrawing your first from a person so that they can see from your lack of interaction with them, that action is wrong. I don't condone that. If you went to somebody's house and they were selling drugs out that house, you wouldn't go back anymore. Hopefully you wouldn't as a Christian. You, you wouldn't want to add your presence to that place affirming that what they're doing is okay. If you went to somebody's house and there was, I'm going to use an extreme example, sex trafficking going on, you wouldn't go back to that place. You wouldn't want to sit there and act normal like everything is fine. It's not fine. You would withdraw yourself from that person to show them, at least by your lack of interaction, I don't agree with that, and I'm not going that place anymore. And guess what? As long as you're doing that, I'm not inviting you to my circle anymore. You do that to show your disapproval of the way a person is living. Not that you are the king of kings and lord of lords, but you follow scripture. And you can't condone what God doesn't condone. Third point, be mindful of your approach. Okay, I'm going to get this scripture. Oh, goodness. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it 3? Oh, Lord. Now my computer messing up on me. It's Paul speaking to Timothy. And here we go. 1 Timothy, get it pulled up here, working on the fly, people. All right. What in the world? <sighs> there we go. All right. What we'll do is first is Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. We'll come back to 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 4. There we go. In verse 6. Now, before we read this verse, there's nothing wrong with being passionate. Uh, there's nothing wrong with defending yourselves. But whether you're being passionate and direct or defending yourselves, you never forsake Christian character. It doesn't matter how angry you are in a situation. It doesn't matter how direct you are you still are to maintain Christian character. And this is Paul, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you should answer every man. Now, now, now listen. This would go in the face of trading insults with a person. This would go in the face of an outright shouting match. This is, when we really think about it, this is a difficult verse, not so much in informal settings, 
It, it could be. But more so in those, not so much in formal settings, but in informal settings. Because when you get comfortable around people, you tend to lower your standard just a little bit, sometimes too much. And that can lead you in a serious, heated situation to say some things that you know you probably shouldn't say. But because you're close with the person, a family member or a really good friend or a neighbor, you can lower the standard too much. And before you know it, you can overstep a forbidden line. So always let your speech be seasoned with salt and with grace that you may know how to answer every man. Meaning God does not give us the liberty to throw down Christian character. All right. First Timothy chapter five I was saying chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, this is a passage of scripture, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul is speaking to Timothy. He says, Rebuke not an elder, but treat him as if he were a father, the younger men as brothers, the older women as like mothers, and the younger women like sisters. Now, now, Paul pretty much covers the entire church. Paul is speaking to Timothy, who is a pastor. The essence of what he's saying is that, Timothy, just because you are a shepherd of a church does not give you the liberty to speak to people improperly. Well, how do I speak to them? If it's an older man or an older woman, you speak to them with the same humility and meekness as you would your own father or as you would your own mother. But what if the elder man or woman in the church has offended me, has done something deliberately to hurt me? They have said things or done things to tear down my character. They've aired out my dirty laundry. The list goes on and on. Well, there does come a time to where you must take a stand, to where you must say something. But you must be mindful of your approach. A pastor or any member, any Christian, we do not have the liberty to throw down Christian character. If it is an older person, man or woman, speak to them with the same humility and meekness you would your own mother and your own father. If it's someone that's younger, that still doesn't give you the, the freedom to act foolish, talk to them like a brother or a sister. Maybe there's a bit more liberty, but you still don't lose your composure. And that's the whole point that we wanted to make. You must not lose your composure. And see, as we sum this up, all these verses, there's a couple of things that we must understand. A couple of things that we must. I'm, I'm glad this happened to you, Sister Austin. A couple of things we must understand. I, I, I want to give you my perspective. My perspective is, this is an unfortunate duty that just comes along with being a pastor. It is something that I'm going to have, typically, more opportunities to do it than people who may not be the shepherd of a church. And so, it is responsibilities for all the church, for everyone, all the time. It, it, it must be done. But nonetheless... It is not something that instinctively to me, I'm just comfortable with. I wish I could avoid it. It's kind of like when I used to pull my children's teeth. We didn't go to the dentist. We didn't have enough money for $100 per tooth times three children when they get to four and five and sitting there and listen, we'd have been went bankrupt. So I had to pull them. And it broke my heart to to see the fear in their eyes, to have to get a towel and that little bitty tooth in your hand, and you don't want to do it. And, and Because it, it, it's in a very real sense affecting me more than it affects them. And I didn't go in there whooping them with a belt and slapping them in the head and snatching them down. I tried to hug them. I tried to pray with them. I gave them popsicles. But it got to a point to where even when their tooth was loose, they would start crying because they knew it was going to have to come out. And I would really be crying on the inside because I knew it had to come out. 
But if you don't pull that tooth, if you don't take that action on the front end, it's going to be worse down the road. When those junior high prom pictures and high school prom pictures come out and the teeth are not straight because daddy or mama didn't have the boldness, the courage to do what needed to be done. See, it's much worse now. And it's much harder to correct now. Something that should have been done at four, five, and six. Now they're getting corrected with a bunch of money and a long process at 18, 19, and 20. And when it comes to offenses, there are some things we must overlook because they're just small, trivial, and insignificant. There are some things that God say, you got to take stand. You can't let that tooth that's loose remain because when the new tooth comes in behind it, you're going to have a double problem. So the person who is callous, arrogant, the person who airs out your dirty laundry, the person that cuts you down, whether it be a church member, whether it be a family member, sad to say that does happen, whomever it may be, when you can clearly see, I wonder if they know how much they hurt me or offend me. And sometimes people can hurt you and offend you and then make a joke out of it. Remember that time I was talking about you? I really embarrassed you, didn't I? Like, whoa, not only did you hurt me, my pain is now your comic relief. And guess what? You must take a stand. But even though you take a stand, you don't allow their attitude to be your attitude. You don't allow their wickedness to be the way that you respond to them in wickedness. Because now you've gone from one wicked person to two. Now, I'll close by telling you this. There was a person that outright was rude to me. It wasn't too long ago, too. They outright were rude on purpose. It was an arrogant, backhanded, somebody a little bit younger than me, too, about the same age. They were outright rude to me. Now, I work with the public, so, but anyway, they were outright rude to me. And I just, okay. It was, it was so blatant and ugly and obvious, they had to come back and say, did I offend you when I said that? I said, yeah, you did. Well, well, why didn't you say nothing? Or, or, or see, I said it because this, that, and the other. I, I just was quiet. I just was quiet. First of all, my personal uh, stance, I don't argue with a foolish person. I, I try not to. Let me say that. I don't argue with a foolish person. Like, mm-mm. You know? And my response, in essence, was we don't have to explain what's already understood. The reason you doubled back and brought it up is because you know what you did was wrong. You know what you said. If you were watching this from the sideline and you weren't involved, you would say, that person just did him wrong. And so I didn't respond in the moment. It was so quick and, 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 and instant. I was almost in shock, like, dog. You know, in my head, I'm like, whoa. I'm like, it's like you collect yourself and you say, did that just happen? Like, they, like you almost want to smile like, Lord, this is... This happens on television. So when they doubled back, and then I began to tell them, because they asked me, if they wouldn't have said anything, I wouldn't have responded because I only have a limited window to deal with them. So I say, once this window's closed, I'll be gone anyway. So it won't be much to talk about. But since they came back, yeah, I told them. I said, yeah, it was rude. It was, it was rude. Uh, honestly, it was arrogant. It was condescending. And I don't think you would like anyone to talk to you like that or your family member or your children or your spouse or your mother. I mean, and when they went into this gymnastics of, well, you see, I had, and it just, I just shut my mouth. I'm like, no, that's pride right there. That's just pride. Pride will stop a person from taking accountability for what they know is wrong. It can be obviously, openly wrong. Everybody, a child could see that's not right. And pride will make a person try to defend what we both know is wrong. So my point is, these things are going to happen. These things are going to take place. Having to correct someone of some ungodly uh, behavior, whether they are kind or not, number one, Make sure it's not insignificant and trivial. If it's something that can be overlooked, overlook it. It's not even worth the time addressing it. But if it is something significant, 
and God shows you, oh, you need to talk about this. You have to pull that tooth. There must be done. Something must be done. Why? Because a Christian must take a stand. Number three, when you take a stand, be mindful of your character. Last scripture, Galatians chapter two. Oh, you thought you were done, didn't you? Verse 11. Galatians 2 and 11. This is Peter being corrected by the apostle Paul. Because when Peter was with the Gentiles, well, he was fine with them. But when the Jews came around, Peter act like the Gentiles wasn't no good. We, we have a country way of saying that in Pine Bluff. Peter was being two-faced. And when Paul got back to Antioch, he was like, oh, no, he's building a wedge between Jew and Gentile? No, 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 no. We are all one in the family of Christ. We're not separate. We are one. He is causing a major stumbling block to God's plan. So look at Galatians 2 and 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Sometimes the quickest road to get there is just to talk and to say it. The quickest road to reconciliation, and even if it doesn't result in reconciliation, and I say even if it doesn't result, because some people are so full of pride, and you all know this to be true, they can be obviously wrong. You know you lied on me. You know you stole from me. You know you maligned my character. You know you hurt me and hurt my family. You know what you said was out of line. You know it, but they will never give you the satisfaction of admitting when they're wrong. So it may not lead to reconciliation, but it will lead to let them know, I'm aware of what you did and I said something to you. Now, what you do with it at that point, that's not up to me. That's not up to me. But if you say nothing, and if you do nothing, and you act like everything is okay, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. It won't change. It can change. I will not put anything past God. But I, we live in a time of people are so prideful, people will not take accountability for their action. Most people don't self-correct. If they've been getting away with mistreating you, they're going to keep mistreating you. Why? You'll end up being their stepping stone. Now, they won't say anything to this person because this person's ungodly and they'll probably, you know, hit below the belt. So I'm going to leave them alone. But I'll say it to you because you ain't going to say nothing. And you'll be mad for today, but next week we cool again. So what does it matter? That's a lack of respect when that happens. I had a situation, this is a close for real. When it speaks to Paul speaking to Peter directly, to where I had to speak to another man because he said something very racially insensitive to me. He had made these little comments. He was from Illinois. He made these little comments that could have been taken the wrong way as a black man, but I didn't. You know, I was like, well, you know, maybe it's his sense of humor. But he said something so directly and overtly. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, me and him got to talk. So I just called him outside in the hallway. Now, now, listen, I'm no tough guy. This is not macho or ego. This is me knowing if I don't say nothing at this level, it's going to get worse. So I guess everything he's been saying, oh, because if you said that and now you're saying this, oh, no, 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 we, we, we got to talk about this. And this wasn't me taking him outside and intimidating him. I just, you know, waited a few minutes. I asked him if he had a moment. He said, yeah, I want to text him. And I, as soon as we got outside, wasn't no small talk. Listen, you said so-and-so, so-and-so, such and such. I didn't appreciate that, man. So that, that, that was really, that was offensive. So that offended me as a man, as a black man. I said, would you please not say that type of stuff again? I said, I don't, I don't like that. I wouldn't say that to you. I would make sure to go out of my way to never offend you or anyone that way. And I'd like for you to do the same thing. Now, that's what I said. But on the inside, I was hot. I was hot in the fish grease. But what does that get you? What, 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 what does that lead to? The loss of whatever? Like, mm -mm. So my point is, there are times to where God has allowed a situation 
to where, yeah, I've told you what to do. Now you have to do it. You have to pull that tooth. So this is not about intimidation, about macho or ego or bravado. This is about the Bible. This is about being true to scripture. And even though you are hesitant and you are non-confrontational and you are kind, these are good qualities to have. That still doesn't mean that you cannot, with the power of God, stand on the word of God and do what God's word says. Because what God expects us to do, he will also equip us to do. So please, ma'am, please, sir, if you're relying on your strength, well, you'll never get it done. If I relied on my strength as a pastor to have to have these awkward meetings, I'd be like, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want, ah. but you have to, because if you don't handle the little bit now, a little leaving, leaving the entire lump of dough. So it must be done in the same way, not just as a pastor, Every Christian, when you're in the Sunday school class and you see it, I don't mind you telling me, hey, so-and-so, but you're there. Put the fire out now. Because when you walk away and talk to 20 people, the fire's still burning. So as it relates to correcting people, lovingly correcting people, whether they are aggressive or rude or not, there does come a time to where God wants us to act. And so hopefully these scriptures have been helpful and beneficial. There are so many more scriptures we could have gone over. But God calls us to act sometime. And sometime our inaction prolongs the situation. I read it this way in a book by Dr. H.L. Wilmington, uh, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. Sometimes your tolerance of sin is treason before the Savior. The fact that God has sat you right there, you see it. You know what the Bible says. You have a personal relationship with the person. You know they're going off the road, but you don't want to trust God enough to be bold enough to let them know that's not right. Whether it's being done to you or to someone else, your tolerance sometimes can be treason. So hopefully this has been a benefit to you all, uh, how to lovingly correct someone of ungodly behavior, irrespective if they are rude or aggressive. You can still lovingly talk. You may not have a kumbaya moment at the end. It may not be a lifetime, mo lifetime moment at the end where you hug each other. You don't go into it wanting division, wanting hard feelings, although sometimes it does happen. It's unavoidable. You hate to say that, but it's unavoidable. Sometimes it is. And sometimes it may start off hard. And I've seen where God turned that thing around. The person comes back and they're like, mm. you could tell they softened their stance. And they have a little bit more of a respect for you because they know, wow, this person don't just talk church. They don't just talk Bible. They don't just have Christian vocabulary. They actually try to do what's in the book. And you never know what type of positive effect that could have on some people. So we'll go ahead and close right there. I, pr I thank God for all of your time. Thank God for all of your participation. Uh, you can please feel free to go to our website, newhebronlr.org, and you can look at past questions, Bible studies. You can look at past Sunday school lessons, morning worship. You can see our current sermon, ser sermon series, or you can find New Hebron on YouTube. and You can find our YouTube channel, and you can see a video of all of these as well. So I, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate your time. appreciate your participation. God bless you, and I pray that you have a safe and a wonderful evening.